Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Kamein. This is the weekly show where we check out the local arts news. We have some indie and unsigned music. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone uh, for a short story and or some poetry. And we check in with Twangling Jack Ford in the Ilk Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. You can listen again on the Listen Again on the Wickham Sound website, on uh, Spotify, iTunes, tunes all of that good stuff uh, we're also repeat here on monday nights if you want to get in touch with me here at the studio you can drop me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk and i particularly want to hear from poets musicians anybody creative people who think there might be a good guest people who have mp3s to share do get in touch i would love to hear from you so um this week we are going to head over very quickly to the rye light zone i guess i'm not sure whether we're going to continue doing the rye light zone so we will see whether i decide to put this in and uh, yeah, then we'll crack on with some music. Okay, so for this week's entry into the Rye Light Zone, we have here a reading from Paul Waters from his novel Blackwater Town. And this was a reading that he did as part of a uh, writer's workshop that we hosted towards the start of 2021, I think, um, during lockdowns, etc. Uh, at Wickham Arts Centre. So over to Paul Waters. Okay, because I haven't read this bit before and I kind of thought I would try it. Um, so usually I read a bit from the very front or there's a, 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 a funny bit where um, the hero, Mackin, meets the woman he falls for called Aoife. Um, but then this is a bit different. So there's going to be uh, an ambush. The, there's the, the idea, this is in the 1950s, long before the Troubles, but there was a war then that people don't really know about. Anyway, there's apparently going to be an IRA attack on an army garrison to steal weapons there so the police are lying in wait and auxiliary police and the army and uh, the information came from Mackin through his undercover work but he realizes two things that one they're not going to arrest anyone they're just going to try and massacre all the the insurgents and also he thinks they're going to try and kill him because he's a, a catholic inside the police and it's a protestant police force and they killed his brother he thinks so he thinks that he's going to be next anyway they're all waiting on the roofs of the buildings around this killing zone. And suddenly somebody walks into the killing zone and he looks drunk, but they think he must be a scout. Or is he really a drunk? But they need to get rid of him before the whole ambush is um, exposed. So, um, and he's told to go and get this drunk guy in front of all the, the people pointing their guns. So Mackin set off downstairs. This is where it ends, he thought. Will he paint me as a hero? A police casualty to justify the massacre, or will they write me off as a traitor who got what he deserved? The hero angle would look better for everyone, thought Mackin. Loyal, decent Catholic, shot down by men so base that they even kill their own. Should prompt a round of condemnation of Republicans from the pulpits. Kinder for his family too. And he gets down and he says to the police who are actually at the door, Look, lads, it's only a drunk making a nuisance of himself. I'm going to shift them before the trouble starts, all right? Mackin could discern no hint of comprehension in the staring faces. Hi, this is important. Don't get carried away and open fire while I'm still out there. I'm one of the good guys. He was suddenly conscious of how useless his gun would be. As soon as one man fired, even by mistake, everyone would follow. He'd be safer without it. He offered his stand to the nearest policeman, who drew back in surprise. Ah, so there is someone in there, said Mackin, trying for humour. Mind this for me till I get your man. I don't want to scare him. Mackin received a nod. Progress, he thought. And I'm serious about not shooting till I'm in the clear. If you jeopardise this operation because you couldn't wait, that's more likely to stop them, he thought. Anyway, he steps out. So across the square, the swaying man had turned down the volume of his shouting with an indistinct mutter. Mackin looked up around the dark windows and rooftops. He saw no one but felt the weapons bristling. So then, he said to himself, stepping forward and legs suddenly numb, but carrying him onward nonetheless. His footsteps seemed uneven, the rhythm of his boots striking the hard surface sounded odd, one boot louder than the other, the sound echoing, bouncing off the hard surfaces, one leg longer than the other, his gait unsteady. If that drunkenness really is an act, thought Mark, and we could both end up dead. Christ, I wish I was back up on the roof. And uh, anyway, Mackin was too close to the drunk to turn back still unnoticed, but in the crosshairs of all those unseen others. He felt the lump in his throat and worried he was about to vomit. He fought back the gagging and rested his hand on his baton. The drunk appeared to sag. 
He really is stuthered, said Mackin in relief. I better grab him before he collapses or I'll never move him. Then the man fumbled at his waist. Oh, Jesus, thought Mackin, this is it. He's getting something out. Mackin could almost sense the hidden soldiers, policemen and B-men tightening their fingers on the triggers. I have to take him now. Mackin stepped beside the cursing, slurring figure. Bit late for a wee dander, isn't it? The man, his hand still at his waistband, turned in surprise. Mackin saw his expression turn to anger and his mouth opened to shout. Mackin drove his baton into the man's stomach like a short sword. He folded forward with a muffled oof. Mackin caught and held him. He looked down for whatever weapon the drunk had been fumbling for. Quickly, quickly, Mackin urged himself. Where is it? Then he saw it, peeping out from the groaning drunk's flies, a small wrinkled, still dribbling. Mackin detected dampness on his own legs. He had caught the drunk just as he had begun to relieve himself towards the garrison. The stream of zigzagged across Mackin's trousers as the man turned. Mackin almost wanted to shove the man aside and throw up his own arms to challenge them all, to turn and shout, come on then, come on. Anyway, I'll stop there. See, that's the thing, you don't, you think, it might get shot, but you might get done instead. You can never <laughs> tell, you can never tell. Anyway, that's a wee bit from awesome. Blackwater Town. So we're going to have a little bit of music here. This is Robert Honor with Breathe. Uh, just Oh, hang fact, it's called Breathe, Just Breathe, featuring Flo. Um, this is off a new EP that he sent me. Um, so big shout out to Robert Honor.
Colorblind by Tom Bradley Jr. And before that, we had Breathe Just Breathe featuring Flow by Robert Honor. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And so it's time to go over to this week's guest, who is the author of The House with Two Letterboxes. We're going to talk to Janet H. Swinney. So over to Janet. So the first question is one I ask everybody, and it's uh, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Right. Well, I'm going to tell you about one I'm in the middle of. Okay. Actually, which is uh, Louise Kennedy's book of short stories, The End of the World is a Cul-de-sac, published by Bloomsbury. I'm about halfway through it, but I think it's absolutely gripping. Um, She's a very powerful writer. Um, She depicts landscape and city situations between people very deftly. And sometimes it's not until you finish the story that um, you begin to get an inkling of what it was about, you know, and and you have to go back and read again. So she's dropped clues all over the place for you, but it's not until afterwards that you begin to realise, oh, wait a bit, there was more to this than met the ear. I'll have to go back and start again. I'm very impressed by her. Yeah. Awesome. That sounds great. And um, just, I guess, on that subject, um, because short story collections, um, I don't know, they're an interesting one. I think um, publishers tend to sort of stay away from them quite often as well. Um, I think because I guess, you know, novels are more uh, more marketable and whatnot. Um, mm. But I mean, what, is, what are your thoughts on the short stories as uh, uh, an art form? Because obviously that's that's what you didn't done with your recent book as well. Um you know, what do they allow you to do that, that, that novels don't allow you to do? Uh, they allow you to cut to the chase, really. I, I think it's a bit like uh, that type of Japanese brush painting where you uh, put in a few depth strokes which hint at something and the reader infers the rest. Um, and I think that... You don't have to bother yourself too much with causality, really. Um, you know, writing detailed accounts of how characters got from A to B, you just cut and start again wherever you want to, and the reader makes the connections. So I think they're they're powerful for that reason. Cool. Um, and I was going to say, I, I suppose as well, um with that book that you just mentioned where, you know, you finish the short story and you almost want to go back and read it again because mm. you've seen this extra layer to it. I mean, I suppose short stories are great for that because if that happened with a novel, that's, you know, eight hours of your life you've got to commit to to reread the whole thing. Whereas with a short story, it's maybe half yeah. an hour like yeah. that. So um, yeah. I suppose it's a good medium for that kind of, that kind of storytelling as well. Yeah, I think a short story is a knife to the soul. The best short stories are a knife to the soul. And I can think of one or or two that are just lodged in my mind now and have been there for for decades. And I've forgotten the names of the authors, but those particular short stories still reverberate with me because they say something uh, profound about life. Awesome. Great. And what is it about short stories that attracted you to them as, as a writer? Was it again that, um, you know, that, that brevity and the, the conciseness of them? No, I don't have a choice in the matter, really. Um, but for me, writing is about insights. So, you know, I get that aha moment when the light bulb goes on uh, and that becomes a short story. It doesn't become a novel. For some reason, yeah. I don't know. I'd maybe need a drug or something to make me change my approach. But that's the way it it happens for me. Cool. Well, I mean, I suppose as well, it's all about you know the the story is as long as as it needs to be to to get its point across. So mm. you know, sometimes mm. you might need a few hundred words. Sometimes, I guess, you do need a novel. <laughs> uh, that's true. But I've also noticed about my own writing that as time has gone on, um, I tend to write in scene. Yeah. So it's quite, my approach, I think, is quite cinematic. And I've actually been toying about with the notion of going down the screenplay route rather than the, the novel route in the future. Yeah. Cool. That's a great idea. Um, and so... Again, on the subject of short stories, uh, who are some of your favourite short story writers? 
Okay, well, I've got a whole queue of them lined up here for you, but they're all right. contemporary writers. Um, and, uh, well, the first one I'm going to mention to you is Mona Dash in her new book, Let Us Look Elsewhere. And uh, she's got a story there about uh, an Asian woman. She's of Asian origin herself, but this is an Asian woman living in the UK who feels that she doesn't fit in because of her Indian accent. So she goes to, you know, some alternative therapist who can modify the voice box. And you can you can choose what kind of accent you would like to have. So she chooses, you know, a, a kind of slightly upmarket um, English accent. And then, of course, it has terrible consequences because um, the way you speak is part of your personal identity. Um, and her family and those around her can't cope with the new voice that she's got. But alas and alack, she's not able to, um, she's left it too late to go back and get it changed. So it's a kind of a powerful meta metaphor about identity and belonging, craving to be part of a culture and uh, not feeling that you're an insider. Um, and the other writers that I want to refer to have a similar sort of perspective. So one is Aileen Chu, and uh, sorry, Elaine Chu, and she wrote a book called The Heartsick Diaspora, which was published about a year ago. Reshma Ria, who's got a new book out called Mrs. Pinto Drives to Happiness, and Jenny Bach, Each of Us Killers. So um, Elaine and Jenny are not based in the UK, but Reshma is. But the three of them have multiple perspectives on, on different societies. They're comfortable in living in more than one place. And so they bring to their short story writing a whole wealth of life experience. Uh, I identify with this because I've been part of a biracial family for um, a number of decades. So um, they're familiar, they're, they write about what it's like to live on the fault lines between different societies uh, and always, uh, you know, being aware of what it means to be an outsider while knowing a society very well yourself. So I, I find that very interesting um, and uh, re very refreshing given the rest of the, the literary market that we're, we're exposed to. And it's notable that all of these short story collections are published by small independent publishers. Yeah. And I was going to ask about that because it, and it kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier. Again, I think, um, you know, the the bigger publishers, a lot of it, it's, it's just about trying to make sure that they're going to either make money or at least not lose too much money. And they kind of see short story collections as a bit of a risk. Um, and and again, it does tend to be the short the you know, the smaller publishers that are putting things out. Um, so you yourself have worked with Fly on the Wall uh, with Isabel yeah. Kenyon and um, they've been putting out some really great short story collections actually she sent me a few of them um, mm -hmm. and I wondered what what your experience was like working with with Fly on the Wall. It's been terrific actually because I would say that Isabel is always upbeat, um, very supportive and very well organized um, so it's been a, a great experience working with her. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. And I was going to ask, um, just moving back a bit to the, the short story co uh, collections that you talked about, and the, the writers that you talked about. It kind of struck me. It sounds as though um, a lot of the short stories that you or the writers that you've really enjoyed, they're almost more about ideas than about, say, plot and character. Um, would you agree with that? And is that something that you, you sort of look out for? Well, the, the, the characters are always vibrant, but I'm interested in fiction that has some kind of social or political dimension to it. And I think my own work is like that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to I was going to say I, I agree with you there. Um, and another thing that sort of struck me about your work, um, I it found at least I found it quite uh, grounded in sort of uh, time and place as well. Was that a deliberate thing on your end? Yes, yeah, so you know, I draw I draw heavily on my own life experience, that, and uh, I I'm, I can't say that I, I write historical fiction, but I also draw upon 
the life experience of other people that I've known who are older than me and what they've told me about their life experience and um, their parents' life experience. Yes. So in terms of um, you were talking about grounding things in particular periods of time, I do like when I when I'm writing about time that isn't now when I'm writing when I'm not writing about the present I like things to be authentic yeah so for instance um I think you've mentioned that in a previous review something about brand names it's yeah. no effort for, it's no effort for me to insert those because I recall a lot of them yeah but, but there's an instance in one of the short stories in this collection where the guy used an in, uses an invalid carriage and I, I couldn't complete that story or I could, without being sure of what the invalid carriage was like. And I had a mental image of, you know, somebody I'd known who used one. And I had to research it to find out what the make and the model was. Now, that doesn't, that detail doesn't actually appear in the, in the story, but I had to know what it was in my own mind before I felt I could uh, actually, you know, describe how he used it, how he himself up and down the street so yes that's that authenticity is is quite important to me and the, i'm a bit of a nerd in some respects so i like to know what locomotives would have been on what line and uh you know what the gauge of the track was and stuff like that um not in this collection but in an in another one where uh, all the stories are related to india or people of indian origin I've spent a lot of time researching um, the functioning of the of the railway system in India and what the setup would be in the cab of a particular locomotive. So, you know, when the driver has to sound the horn, I want to know where the driver is going to be reaching. I, I am a bit like that, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense, though. I, I was talking to a friend recently um, and we were, we were talking about short stories, actually, and he was mm -hmm. saying about... Um, even in short stories, uh, you, you generally want your characters to have some sort of backstory. And you, you, it, as opposed to a novel, a novel, you might spend mm -hmm. a lot of time setting it up. And in a short story, it might just need to be a line or something like that. Um, but we were saying as well, it's generally one of those things where even if it doesn't actually make it into the story, it's something that you as the writer need to know. Um, and I suppose it's similar with a lot of those details. And especially when writing historically, um, you need to know those details, whether or not they make it into the story mm. um, is almost is almost secondary, as long as you yourself as the writer sort of are aware of them. Yeah, you can actually start with a detail like that. I do find uh, um, small details like that can be a trigger for a story but they may not feature in the story by the time I finish. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Humans Can't Reboot with Lost Soul. I feel 
Till I'm here, no amount of rest can kill the way I feel I wanna ease the pain and tightness within So I'll just pretend to be okay and hope one day You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Janet H. Swinney. Let's chat. Do, do you ever find it a challenge, though? Because I could imagine you could very easily get like get lost in a, a research rabbit hole and spend loads of time researching and not actually spending any time writing. Is is it ever a challenge to balance the two? Uh, yeah, I've, I've, got a, I've got another story again, not in this collection, collection but about um, tennis. And all I know is, uh, all I knew originally was about watching Wimbledon on the telly. But it was absolutely essential for the story that I should, you know, not make awful blunders about tennis playing and what it involves. So as I said, there's loads of research about that. And I was aware that I was getting deeper and deeper into the structure of um, professional tennis playing and tournaments and so on. Uh, but, you know, it has to be done. You do it, and then you dump a lot of it to be able to write with freedom. Uh, that's what it's about, I think. Cool. Yeah, but, sounds um, great. You you were asking me about place as well, though, uh, and, and uh, about to what extent my stories are grounded in place. Now, as it happens, all the stories in this collection are located in the northeast of England. Well, so... You know, I've got a lot to draw on there because that's where I was born and grew up. And I went back quite a bit later on in life. Um, and, and uh, you know, you could see the way things were changing over the years because of um, economic and political changes and so on. But it, I think it's true of all my writer. And I like to travel. And wherever I go... Um, I set myself the task of being an observer and I try to figure out now what's the story in this place? What, what's going on here? You know, trying to observe the way people live their lives, conduct themselves uh, and the challenges they face and then trying to figure out is there, a, is there a tale I could take away from this and who are the, who are the players here? Yeah. Cool. So, um, uh, in terms of the new collection, um, do you have a particular story from within it that's that's a favourite for you? Um, that's a tricky one, you know, because you spend as much energy and dedication on one as you do on another. So, they're all my children, as it were. Um, but I, I would say... I'm very fond of tenterhooks because I like all the characters in there. Even though some of them are awkward people, I, I kind of enjoy all those characters. Um, I'm proud of the title story because I think it does say something important about what, what people are having to live through in, in the Northeast at the present time. Uh, but if I want a bit of a laugh, then I will have a look at the army on the move. 
So one of the things I'm curious about, because again, as a short story collection, it's not like a novel that has a defined start mm. and end. So how did you decide when the collection was finished? It, was it just sort of a feeling or would you, did you sort of only have a certain set of stories that kind of went with the theme? So how did you decide when, yeah. you know, done? Well, yeah, I didn't, I didn't set out to write this particular collection. Um, so I write stories in whatever order they occur to me. So I might be moving from one set in the Northeast to one set in India, to one set in South East London. Um, but I've got my eye all, all the time open to, um, what publishers are looking for. So Isabel, um, you know, had her window open, as they say. Um, at, at a certain point, and she was looking for um, up to 40,000 words of um, stories that would interest her. And what, what interested me about Fly on the Wall as a publisher is that they have this strap line that says a uh, publisher with a conscience. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, let's, let's uh, hunt these Northeastern stories in then and see how we go. So he yeah, accepted them up to 40,000 words. And then when we thought about it afterwards, you know, once she was committed to publishing them and was starting to talk to other people about them, we realized that there was a, um, a theme, a further theme in there about um, gender based violence. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, actually, you know, I've got more, more stuff on that. Um, would you like to have a look? So she did, and included more stories. So it, it's it, the, the collection is bigger than that forty thousand words now. Yeah, and so it kind of grew all, almost organically as well. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, and can you tell us a little bit about? So that, that's obviously uh, the house with two letterboxes, and that came mm -hmm. out. I think mm -hmm. it, when it came out, it was only a few days ago, wasn't it? Just on the on the third of December, officially, yes. Um, and so can you tell us about um, you mentioned your other collection as well is there only the one other collection out at the moment or have you got multiple out um, my first collection is called The Map of Bihar and Other Stories, that's a different publisher the K.D. Gregory Press um, I've, and I've got individual stories around and about in, in journals and so on which you can find out about from my website um, but now I've got, I've, I've got this third collection that I, which I'd like a publisher for, and this is really about the fraught relationship between um, India and 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 uh, the UK uh, from just before the partition of India onwards, and it's um, expressed through the lives of three cousins who come here in the sixties trying to find a, a better life for themselves. Um, but, it, you know, it's about how, despite India in its own way, these two countries are locked in this uncomfortable relationship with each other and, and, and uh, can't really get free of each other. Mm. That sounds fascinating. So I guess, uh, I mean, one of the, well, we're, we're pretty much coming up to the end now anyway. And one of the questions I was going to ask is, what's next for you? So I suppose that's what's next for you is, is spending 2022 looking for a home for that. I'd like a home for that. Um, I'm, I've got more stories that I can uh, develop into a, um, another collection set in the Northeast, or I might even be able to weave that into some kind of loose novel format. I've got a play about the partition of India based on the stories of a very famous writer called Mantle which is also looking for a home. And I, as I said, I'm also considering turning my attention to screenplays now because of, mm -hmm. because of the way my thought processes have developed, really. Yeah. And obviously you'll be, you'll be promoting uh, the How to Two Letterboxes as well, so that'll be keeping you busy too. Yes, as avidly as I can, really. Yeah, so I've got a, a reading coming off this week at a local bookshop. Awesome. Cool. And uh, where can people go to find out more about you? Um, so your website, social media, all that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm most, well, my website is pretty comprehensive and that'll give you an overview of all, all the work that I've done. And there are quite a lot of free downloads there um, to look at. I'm active on Facebook and also on Twitter. 
so I'm more effective on Facebook than on Twitter. Big thank you to Janet H. Swinney for joining us. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is my band, The Ilk, with Sober.
wish I could check these feelings and run away. That was Friends Like You by The Phenomenots, and before that we had Sober by The Ilk. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and we're going to head over to The Ilk Shed for this week's album review from Twanglin' Jack Ford. A Christmas gift for you, Phil Spector, another of my charity shop finds. Christmas in the 60s benefited from all the 70s Christmas songs having not yet been written. Wizard Slade and the Pogues all have a degree of merit, But for every Merry Christmas War is over, there is a simply having a wonderful Christmas time or step into Christmas. Even the bearable ones are overplayed. But before all that, we had Phil Spector's Christmas Gift for You. I remember as a child at my auntie's Christmas and New Year's Eve parties, teenage girls in voluminous party frocks and beehive hairdos would copy the dances demonstrated on Ready Steady Go to these songs playing on a gramophone player. Even Springsteen and Dylan have copied songs from it. Spectre wrote the rulebook for Christmas singles, slavishly copied by Roy Wood. The wall of sound with sleigh bells and all the other bells and whistles. Gospelly soul, or the sound of a sassy adenoidal New York Italian girl gang. Darlene Love kicks it off with White Christmas, sung as it should be by someone literally on a sunny day in LA. You can picture her and the Renettes and the Crystals sweating in sweaters, making a fake snowman that looks like Parson Brown and naming him Frosty. Then sitting by a fire, their cheeks all rosy and comfy and cosy and ding-a-ling-a-ling-a-ling-dong-ding. Definitely on the nice list. A Christmas album for those who do not like Christmas songs or even a complete Grinch like me. And I am well known on the Wickham music scene for not liking Christmas. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. If you've got some tunes you'd like to send me, you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I always love to hear from local musicians, poets, anybody with MP3s, anyone who thinks there might be a good guest for the show. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You can listen again on uh, Wickham Sound on Monday nights when we're repeated. We are on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're on iTunes and Spotify and all of that stuff. We also have a Facebook page if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. So that's about it for this week. I'm going to leave you with one last tune. And this is the incredible Steph Willis with All In. I'll see you next week. Lately, I've been thinking about you daily. Caught up in the heat of the night that you caught my eye They called time and I said goodbye Left us, right there up in the distance Surrounded by the walls that I made just to keep me safe But you walk right through my barricades Call me up in the middle of the night Cause you can't wait till the morning light You told me everything would be alright You told me not to worry, no to worry Be my peace Come be my saviour